we are going to make that video available, and you guys pray that God can continue to use this testimony. You may be somebody who really badly needed to hear that today. Uh, I, I'm sure that that is the case. And so thank you, Kelly, so much. Thank you so much for uh, being obedient to the Holy Spirit. Y'all pray for Kelly. Um, you know, you don't, you, don't, uh, you don't take this one on without the devil getting mad at you. So you pray for her. And uh, let's pray together now. Lord, we thank you that you, your truth, your pure truth saves us. Saves us. And we thank you for how uh, the truth of who you made Kelly to be saved her. And we're thankful, God. We're thankful for Scott and Joseph and Jonathan and Julia. God, their family how they are a blessing to so many. And God, the devil had plans to destroy her just like, and all of them, and and make those children not even be. And he has plans to do the same in the lives of those who are listening today and those that are in this place today. Oh God, please, please God, help us. Help our children, help our men and women. Uh, God, to... Just trust you, to hold on to you. We pray for our families. God, we pray for our society. We pray for our schools. We pray for Christian teachers and administrators and counselors and school board members, God, that we will stand on your truth, lovingly, sure, but firmly. Oh, God, please, again, Lord, we pray your protection over Scott and Kelly now, their children. And Lord, we pray that we will hear you now. And God, that today we will trust you and your word and just, and just obey it. God, please help us not come today and let all of this just bounce off of us and go, well, that was a good day in church. But Lord, please tell us everything now that you want us to hear as you speak to our homes in the name of Jesus Christ who proves the trustworthiness and the lovingness of our God. Amen. Let's get quickly into Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Ephesians 5, 21. I'll start reading, you catch up. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, Submit yourselves to your own husbands. Ladies, will you say the word submit? Yeah, that's what I thought I'd (laughs) say. That's what I thought. You know, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. You know what that means? That means that you should treat your husband as if you are married to Jesus. That's what it means. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. When these words are read, you can almost feel the bristling. It's kind of funny. I knew I'd get this weak little sentiment. Yeah, no, but you don't even you say the word. Much less do the deed of submission. There's a discomfort. When, when this passage is read, you can almost see the argument bubbling up within people. They want to respond. They want to say, are you kidding me? This is the year 2022. It is 2020. Yeah, 2022. But God has said things in his word that didn't make sense sometimes. And if that doesn't make sense to you, that wives should submit to their own husbands as to the Lord Jesus. If that doesn't make sense to you, I want to remind you of other things that God said to do that didn't make any sense. He told a man to build a gigantic boat in the middle of a grassy plain. 
He told a man who was 100 years old that his 90-year-old wife was going to have a baby. Believe it. Trust him. He was told to take that baby boy once it was born up Mount Moriah and sacrifice him on an altar. Another family was told to put their baby in a basket and float him down the Nile River. The people of Israel were told to paint their doorpost with the lamb's blood. Doesn't make any sense. Put a piece of wood in the bitter water and it'll become sweet. Strike the rock and watch the water fill the dry riverbeds. Walk around the walls of Jericho once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, walk around it seven times and blow your horns. And the walls will fall down. One man was told to take his army of 32,000 soldiers and send everybody home but 300 of them. And then to take on the 135,000 Midianites with torches, clay pots, and trumpets. Boop, boop, and shout. And you'll win. God tells us to do unreasonable things because He has His reasons. And we need to trust Him. God said to trust a young... A trust that a young woman, a virgin, in a small village in northern Israel, will be the mother of the eternal and only begotten Son of God. And that child will grow up to die on a cross and be the atonement for your sins and mine. Trust Him. Trust Him. Genesis 15, 6 says, Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Trust Him. Trust Him. That word believed God in Genesis 15, 6 is the word aman. It's where we get the word amen. It's to put your full weight into something. Trusting Him completely. Just trust Him. If we had time and we don't, we'll do this another day. I'd bring some of you men up here and I'd just jump in your arms. You know why? I trust you. That's the aman faith that saves. Abraham believed God. He trusted Him fully. And God who has all the righteousness, credited him as righteous. Ladies, trust God's word here. I know it's not easy to submit to your own flawed and fallen husband as you would to Jesus Christ, but trust God. He has his reasons, and whether we know them or not, he has his reasons. I'll share one that I know is here today at the end of our service. But let's keep going now because we've talked to the wives long enough. And so let's go on to verse 25. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives. And I want you to notice how much longer the instructions for the husbands are. <laughs> husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, one body, one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Elizabeth Barrett Browning for Valentine's Day, by the way, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, uh, she wrote 44 love sonnets for Valentine's Day. I believe it was in the year 1850. The 43rd of those sonnets was, and you guys may not know all those sonnets, but you probably have heard a little bit of this one. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. 
Uh, and then she starts ripping off Ephesians 3, talking about the, the depth, the height, the width, and the length of the love of Christ. I love thee to the depth, the breadth, and the height. My soul can reach when feeling out of sight. And then it goes on and on. And I've got to tell you, I read this poem several times, and mine are better, uh, just so you know. <laughs> In my opinion. But let's count the ways. That's, how, how is the husband to count? How is the husband to love his wife? The passage here will tell us the ways the husband is supposed to love his wife. Let's count the ways. The first way is that, brothers, you need to love your wife with sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. If I can point something out to you, a word that you probably know if you've been in church you know, for a few years anyway. Husbands, agapate your wives. Just as Christ agapesen the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to agapan their wives as their own body. He who agapa his, his wife, Agabato, himself. All of these words are versions of the word agape. All of them. There is no other love word in this entire passage, and I, I count six. I, I might have counted wrong. It seems like there's even more, but there's at least six agapes in this passage. Think about what we know about the word agape. There are several Greek words for love. And, and none of those are used here. Storge, familial love, loving your family members. We don't love our wives because she's our family. Not eros. We don't love our wives because she's hot. <laughs> and by the way, this has not, not happened to me at all, but Proverbs 31 says that beauty is fleeting. Of course, it hasn't happened in my house. Um, but it could one day, maybe. A million years from now. But the love that's being commanded of us is not, a, not eros. That is fleeting. It's not phileo, loving her because she's your companion and friend. It's agape, like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Agape is selfless and giving and faithful love. It's a love of the will. It's a love of choice. It's not a love of feelings and dependent on circumstances. Agape is described in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. This is the way you're supposed to love your wife. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Hello, let me read that one again. It keeps no record of wrongs. Uh, it keeps no record of wrongs. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. And it keeps no records of wrongs. And love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Agape never fails. It never fails. Agape is a word that, like I say, most of us are familiar with if we've been in church. We learned a, a definition of agape in Sunday school and things like that. Agape is, let's just see if you guys remember. Agape is blank love. What's the word? Unconditional. Agape is unconditional love, right? Now, when you're talking about this text right here, and this is the conversation that we as a church are having right now, we're having this conversation. I hope that you're talking about it at home as you drive and you come in and go in and everything like that. I know that Julie has begun to call Craig her Lord, although I think she's laughing about it. But I, I'm glad that, uh, uh, you know, this is a, uh, a conversation that we're all having. But when we have this conversation, invariably, women will say, I would submit to him if he loved me like Christ loved the church. And invariably, husbands will say, I would love her like Christ loved the church if she would submit to me. What are those ifs? Conditions. 
their conditions. And what is agape? That unconditional love. Love comes first. Love comes first. If you know anything about marriage, if you're at all... Uh, who left that hair up here? Okay, anyway. Uh, I probably brought it for my dogs. I'm covered in my dogs. Where was I? See, now I'm totally distracted. We put these conditions on, but we need to do like God has done. God demonstrated his love for us in this while we were still Christ died for us. Romans 5 8. Love came first. Now he didn't say when they're worthy, when they, when they get their act together, when they start walking right, if they do this, then I will love them. Then they will be worthy of Christ's sacrifice. He loved us when we were sinners in our, the depth of our sin and depravity and rebellion against Him. When we were His enemies, He loved us. Love comes first. It's unconditional. And we need to see brothers, husbands, we don't wait. If you are the leader man, if you are the big stuff in your house, if you are the Lord of your castle, then you need to lead in love. You need to lead in love, no matter what. Demonstrate to your wife that you're willing to sacrifice. Your sacrifice proves your love. And sacrifice means you're doing things you wouldn't do. Except for that you love her. You're giving up your wants and wishes, preferences, because you love her. And so this has to do with the TV channel. It does. It has to do with you getting up off the couch and studying with the kids, playing with the kids, running the vacuum cleaner, cleaning the bathroom. Big stuff. Go into the grocery store. I'll tell you the truth. My wife doesn't like going to the grocery store. Sorry. But you know, I can do that. And if, if, if that's all it takes to show her that I love her, then I am fine going to the grocery store. And I get to pick my cookies. <laughs> Philippians 2.5 says, Your attitude, brother, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, he, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Love your wife with sacrificing love. The night Jesus was betrayed, he and his disciples were having the Passover meal together. And the apostles, those sainted apostles, were having an argument at the Passover meal on the night that Jesus was betrayed. What were they arguing about? Who was the greatest? Who's the boss? Who's the big man among them? If ever there was a moment when Jesus could have, you know, justifiably cleaned house. Are you kidding me? After all that he was going through, in just in a moment, he'll be bleeding sweat drops of blood as he agonizes in prayer. And they're arguing about who's the boss. Who's the big man? What did Jesus do on that night in response to their argument? He got up from the table. And he wrapped a towel around his waist. And he went to every one of them. And did the job that none of them would condescend to do. And he washed their feet. Love your wife like Jesus loves church sacrificing brothers love your wives as we're counting the ways number two love your wife with a sanctifying love sanctifying love our translation that we use here is is to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word 
uh, making her holy is the word hagiatso, to sanctify. What does sanctify mean? It means set apart. Set her apart. Help, help her to become more. Help her on her journey of trying to be a, a, a better person. Somebody who's more reflective of Christ and the life that he has in her. Help her be set apart for, for greater things. Man, set your wife up to succeed and grow. Help her be sanctified with your love. Male headship is hard to accept. It's hard to accept because men have behaved badly. This, these verses about submission, say submission. Eh. <laughs> these verses about submission make women and men bristle. Because men have behaved badly. They have misused this authority. They have abused the ones who were in their care to love. There is sin in men so much so that the examples are too many to count. So many men that should have been trustworthy have proven themselves not to be trustworthy. And people have had experiences. So they say, I can't go with this. Same thing is true of churches. People say, I can't trust myself to a church because I've had bad experiences. Because the people at church have been this way or that way. I want to tell you right now, me personally and my family, I've had more bad experiences in church than all of you. Growing up as a pastor's kid and seeing how church people could be. But I'm not here for the hypocrites. I'm here for my Savior, my God. And I'm here to be strong against those hypocrites and those bullies. You see, the devil loves to take misuse and abuse and, and, and bad examples and bad experiences and, and, and try to undermine the truth and get us away from the truth. We've got to take this back. Brothers, we've got to take this back. We've got to love our wives like Christ loved the church. And wives, as hard as it is, you've got to submit to your husbands. The enemy, the enemy introduces tares. He unleashes the wolves. And he capitalizes on every episode and evidence of abuse and misuse of authority. And I want to tell you that the stinking devil, stinking devil, he does these awful things in our lives and for some reason we blame God and his church for them. That's how scheming he is. Don't let him do it. You hold on to God. You hold on to truth. You hold on to his word. Male headship. Done wrong says I'm the boss and she has to submit to me. I kind of stole this from Bodie Balkum. Sorry. But you're not the boss, dude. You're the head. It's different. The head, like Christ, is the head of the church. You are the pastor of your family. You're the shepherd of the sheep that God placed in your care. That means you lead in love. You lead in prayer. You know how many men won't actually pray out loud who call themselves Christians? I don't let a 14-year-old in youth get away with that. You are the head of your home. You have spiritual responsibilities. You lead in prayer. You lead in worship. These jokers who stand here like this during worship. You need to wake up. They're all looking to you. You're the head. Not the boss. You're the head. You need to lead in giving. You need to teach your kids to give generously. For God's purposes in his kingdom. You need to lead in serving. You need to go, hey guys, how many Samaritan's purse boxes do y'all want to get this year? Y'all want to, let's finally sponsor a Compassion International kid. Man, let's get out and tell, let's go out with the outreach group. Let's invite kids to the, to the party this afternoon. <laughs> right? Dads, lead. Dad, you should be the chief disciple maker in your home. Leading as an example of what it means to trust and follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Sanctify your wife by washing her with God's Word. Make God's Word the ever-present atmosphere of your home. Deuteronomy eleven eighteen says, fix these words of mine. God says, fix these words of mine in your hearts and in your minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. This is, this is, you, you should be constantly talking to your family about God's Word. There should be theological conversations going on as your family is in the Word. And, and you should be talking about, oh, you know, this reminds me of what we were reading and what we were praying about earlier. Dads, write them down on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. So we count the ways. We count the ways. We love her with a sacrificing love and we love her with a sanctifying love. We love her with a securing love. Love your wife with a securing love. Let's read verses 28 through 31 again. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and they care for it, for their body, just as Christ does the church for members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. Verse 29 says that we feed and we care for our bodies. These words are uh, feed and care for. Boop, boop, beep, bop, boop. Boop, boop, bop. How's it going back there? This, uh, these Greek words for feed and care for. Ektrefe means to nurture, to bring up, to nourish, to mature. For some reason, I know there's a lot of uh, metaphors in this passage, but I get a picture of a little plant trying to survive in a pot in a windowsill. And guys, we need to help, help it survive. We need to talk to it. We need to let it fill our breath and catch the carbon dioxide. We need to talk to it and nurture it. We need to do this for our wives to bring them up, to nourish them, to help them mature and grow into who they're, who they're supposed to be, who they are. We nurture our wives. Christ nurtures the church. And care for is thou pay. It means to cherish, to comfort, to foster, to warm. I want to tell you something right now. More than anything else that you can give your wife or do for her, your wife needs this kind of securing love from her husband. A love that comforts and warms and nourishes and fosters and nurtures and brings her up. She needs to feel safe and cared for. She needs to know that her home is stable. And I want you to think about the things that undermine this securing love that is being commanded of us brothers here. Alcohol, anger. Guys, when you yell at your wife, you strip away everything that makes her feel safe. You strip away everything that makes the home feel stable. You, you, make, you, 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 you make her fear. The very opposite. Don't ever yell at your wife. There are better ways to talk. You don't yell at your wife and you strip away her feeling of security that she so desperately needs. Alcohol, anger, selfishness, fear, irresponsibility, laziness, making her feel alone and on her own. These undo the sense of security that God is commanding you to provide. Give her a securing love. Nourish her, comfort her, foster her, cherish her. Talk about one flesh, one body. I, when I think of this, I think of engrafting or transplants. Any of you guys ever had to have a skin graft or something like that? You know somebody that did? That's, that's, that's delicate stuff, gra engrafting tissue onto a body. Or, or a new kidney or a heart or a lung or eyes. When the rapture comes, by the way, if the person you got it from is saved and you're not, you're going <laughs> to lose. <laughs> bah! 
What just happened? But you think about, you think about what it takes to graft in an organ or a tissue into a body and what care that takes so that it's not rejected. Great care needs to be taken to secure that new tissue into the body to make sure it's fully accepted. Husbands, love your wives with sacrificial love, sanctifying love, and securing love. And as we close today, did you notice all the references to Christ and the church? I mean, there's only three verses in the whole block that don't have Christ and the church. Wives, submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Every verse except for verse 21, 31, and, or 21, 28, and 33, I think, are the only ones who don't have references to Christ in the church. If you're having, and I, I said before, sometimes God tells us to do something and he doesn't explain why. He doesn't explain why, and he's not under obligation to explain why. He does, you know, if you're waiting for God to explain himself before you're going to obey him, you're in trouble. And you're, you're, you're going to be sorry. But in this case, he does make it clear why he is giving this instruction, and we need to hear it. God loves pictures. God loves pictures. He loves this picture. He commanded this picture. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ lived out in somebody that's following him. You're, you're now a new creation. You don't have to worry about death ever again. Symbolized in a picture. He loves this picture. He loves the bread and the cup, the body and the blood. And remembering always of what he did for us to buy our salvation. And he gives us a picture here. Your marriage is a picture of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his people. And you, if you need a reason to submit, if you need a reason to love like Christ loved the church, the reason is that the world needs to see the relationship of God and his people lived out in your marriage. And he didn't have to give us that, but he does. And he went all the way back. The Spirit took us all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. God put, he, 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 there was no helper suitable for Adam. It wasn't good that he was alone. He put him to sleep. And he took a rib from his side and he fashioned this rib into a person. Person. Didn't, by the way, take the bone out of his foot. Amen? And did not take it out of his head. Took him out of his side. And Adam woke up, and there she was. She was just, uh, you know, born, fully grown, fully alert, fully aware, standing there, looking at him. He just woke up, looking at her. Hey. <laughs> How you doing? Uh, And this is what he said. And this is what he said. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother, quoted here in Ephesians 5. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. And they became one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. He's talking about, it's a great mystery, but he's talking about the church. Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is his bride. Jesus used parables to talk about himself being the bridegroom and the church being the bride. John the Baptist said, I, I'm not the groom, he's the groom. His people are the bride. 
Revelation gives us the wedding banquet in Revelation 19, the great banquet, when we all get together for the big party. And Revelation 21 gives us the holy city, the new Jerusalem, sent out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Jesus loves the church sacrificially. He saw you, and he chose you, and he loves you, and he knew you. And even though he knew you would sin, he still created you, knowing that it was going to cost him to redeem you. You are worth dying for. He loves you sacrificially. And he loves the church with sanctifying love. He feeds us and washes us and nourishes us and comforts us and cherishes us and warms us. He'll never leave us. Jesus loves the church with a securing love. We are engrafted branches. We have become part of his body. He will never reject us. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They'll never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who's given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. You are double-fisted secure. If you are saved, you are safe. If you are saved, you are safe. So don't fear he loves you with a securing love. We're going to finish this day today by praying as couples. Again, if you're, if you're not with your spouse today, if he's already in heaven, then we are going to pray for you too. And if you're still waiting for that day when you can, you know, meet her or him and begin this journey... We're going to ask you just to pray that the Lord will guide you and make you wise in your choices as you approach that part of your life. So I'm going to ask husbands and wives to take each other by the hand. And once again, I'm going to ask you guys to take a moment together. Guys, you lead. You're the head. If you have failed your wife, to be sacrificial as much as you should have been, to be sanctifying as much as you should have been, to be securing as much as you should have been. Tell her you're sorry. Tell God you're sorry. And you pray for her. And dear lady, if you have not submitted to your husband the way that Christ has told you to do, tell him that you're ready. Tell him that you're ready to redouble your effort and your surrender and your submission. Say submission. Yeah, okay. Say it to him. You don't have to say it to me. So let's take a moment as, our, as Joey comes to lead us in music. He's going to play something while we pray. We'll take a few minutes to pray and then we'll, we'll roll over into an invitation time. But just take time now to pray. I want you now. Bow our hearts. Let's pray.